1974, Creighton Abrams, who was a famous tank commander during, uh, during World War II, he's now the Army Chief of Staff, and he says, man, we're, uh, we're not ready for a lot of the stuff that, that he sees on the horizon, that he sees in the world. So he stands up two Ranger battalions, the 1st Battalion and the 2nd Battalion. 1st Battalion is on the east. where Abrams tank came from? Exactly. That, that is, the, that is the, uh, the Abrams tank dude. Exactly. So Abrams stands up the Rangers and, uh, because he wants a rapidly deployable premier infantry battalion to be able to respond to some of these hot spots and crises around the, around the world. Now the Abrams or the the so there's a it's called the Abrams Charter, right? So you're there you're going to get more stuff. In fact, Abrams was um, was actually told, hey, why do you treat the Rangers so well? And he says, well, if you want the same treatment, then join the Rangers. And uh, so they the Rangers would hold um, Army Plus standards. You know, they actually had the Ranger standard, uh, both physical, mental, and, uh, and and what you know the way they operated, everything from haircuts to to how you to your personal appearance. And if you failed any of the Ranger standards, then you could be relief, relieved for standards. If, uh, Do they if it, allow beards, Rick? But no, they did not. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, this is my quarantine beard. Watch it when I go back outside. <laughs> so the uh, if it was a light um, violation of Ranger standards, maybe you could come back. But you'd have to go through all the stuff from the PT test, swim test, road march, and uh, go through their – indoctrination program it was the ranger indoctrination program at the time i think they've since renamed it but uh, probably the ranger orientation program and uh, so you could you could come back and uh, so that's that's the uh, that's 1974 i joined these cats in 1978 so within a year my uh, my company commander is david grange and uh, i mean he was the guy that i would hold up um, every officer for the rest of my career you know, had to meet that template and, and, and very few of them got, got to that level. And uh, just a, a terrific guy. I mean, fit, smart, technically and tactically proficient. Second generation Ranger. His dad was, uh, was a World War II Ranger. He did best Ranger before there was a best Ranger. I mean, the uh, Charlie company, that, that company would do best Ranger competitions for PT, for morning PT. And uh, you would roll out there for morning uh, physical training. And uh, they would say the uniform is, you know, fluff and buff, which was, your, your fatigues, boots, um, your load carrying equipment, and your rifle with a sling rope and snap link. And a sling rope is about a 12 foot long piece of rope that you would make a Swiss seat with for rappelling or that you would tie around something to carry. And uh, so it was just a, a 12 foot. I know you have one behind you. <laughs> so it was a 12 foot, this is a 120 foot rope, but it's a 12 foot section of this okay. and, uh, with snap link and gloves. So you'd roll out there and then his, he had a, a B team, you know, or a headquarters team that uh, was a little more robust than your regular company. And he would just work those guys to death. So you would show up at your formation area and uh, there would be a big, long wooden box and uh, full of sand. There'd be another smaller wooden box full of sand. There'd be a, a litter, you know, a stretcher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, then there would be five gallon water cans full of water and big um, ration, cases of ration. So you get a few minutes to, to figure out who in the platoon was going to carry what, and then uh, then you'd, you'd mount up, you'd load up, and then you would start in a uh, in a tactical formation. You have one guy on either side of the road, and you would start on either a, a nine or a thirteen mile road march that would take you around perimeter road of Hunter Army Airfield. And generally, somewhere early in the march, you know, he'd come by and he'd say, "This guy's down." And uh, so that guy would go down. You'd have to stop. You'd have to secure the place. The medics would get on him, and and you know. Put a, put a splint or, or a sucking chest wound bandage or, or in, in actually in, insert an IV and, uh, and, and bring this, you know, stabilize this kid. Then you put him on the stretcher and then you got to figure out, okay, how are we going to cross load all the different pieces of equipment that we have because we have to have four guys now carry this litter. And uh, so now the platoon has got a, got a casualty, you're carrying them on a litter plus all the stuff. So about every two miles, you would stop, you'd set up in a little, uh, you know, patrol base, and you would have some type of ranger stakes that you would have to have to do. You know, you did have to identify armored vehicles, you know, call for and adjust indirect fire. Uh, one time we had to rig a, a bridge for explosives. You'd have to go up, recon the bridge, you know, see how th thick the timbers were, figure the explosives, and then, uh, and then actually do a ring main and, uh, you know, how, how would we destroy this bridge? Uh, another time we had to push start a deuce and a half. 
And uh, so uh, one time we had to move an aircraft off the apron, a C-130. And you can actually roll those things. Get, yeah, C-130. You have to get up behind the tires and, and get it rocking, but you could actually get that thing moving. How many of you were there? Uh, a platoon. You'd have 40 guys. And uh, so you just get on it like ants. Uh, we used to pull Jeeps uh, with ropes. I mean, the guy was uh, tr hard. truly amazing. And uh, so and then you'd have either platoon size, squad size, or individual competitions as well. Sometimes it would end at the, at the rifle range. And uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the kind of stuff that we just did for fun. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, boom, the, uh, the Rainies take down the, uh, they, they take down the embassy. And, uh, and I think the Shah of Iran, a little heavy handed, uh, but he was pro Western and uh, he was progressive by our standards. So he therefore, and he was against the Soviets. So therefore he's our friend, mm. uh, but not well liked among the, uh, you know, a lot of the population that didn't agree with him. Uh, the Islamists hated him because he was pro Western. Mm -hmm. so when he, uh, I think he got cancer or got, got sick, uh, had to leave the country to, uh, for an operation and bam, the, uh, the students and the Islamists take over. They take over the embassy and they take uh, 52 U.S. hostages. So right in the middle of this thing, we're, we're, we, the U.S., are trying to figure out well, what do we do about it. I've got my full field layout. Of course you do. To my rear. Is that your original stuff? Uh, pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's the uniform we would have worn, the helmet, the boots, the uh, everything we would have carried, minus the morphine and the live hand grenades. Well, I'm glad that you omitted those two. <laughs>